All right, y'all. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join us, guys, those of you at home as, the, as well as the people here uh, kind of on screen. Today, we have the pleasure of going over some really outstanding wines with some really outstanding people. We're going to be focusing on the Piedmont region of Italy. We are joined by Cody with Virtuoso Wine and Spirits, and he's right there in front of that beautiful painting. And we have Lyle Railsback, who is the uh, National Portfolio Manager for Kermit Lynch Wine Imports. Now, I imagine the name Kermit Lynch sounds a little bit familiar from those of you who uh, spend a little bit of time at the bar, a Camerata, or who go to a wine shop. You know, one of the most important, if not the most Im Im uh, important importer in the United States, bringing us so many fantastic wines, giving us access to producers, to regions and really helping shape the culture of wine in the United States. But, you know, it's not for me to talk about. I'm going to hand this over to Lyle because he's going to give us some really great insight onto Kermit Lynch. And then we're going to jump into these fantastic wines. Awesome, Tim. Thanks for having me. Cody, thanks for setting this up. Uh, I'm sorry I can't be there with you guys in Texas. Um, I'm here quarantined in New York City for the time being. It's a strange place to be right now. Uh, just trying to stay focused and find solace in some of the awesome wines we're selling and importing. Um, I've worked for Kermit for 11 years. Uh, I do national sales now. I started in Portland, Oregon as the Northwest sales manager and my job sort of changed over the last decade a bit. Uh, Kermit for me, I worked in restaurants for a decade before working for Kermit. I worked for a wine wholesaler briefly who was Kermit's distributor in Washington, D.C., and now I've had the pleasure to work for him directly for over a decade, like I mentioned. He is kind of the guy who started it all as far as small importing. This is Kermit's book. Um, if anyone is interested in learning more about wine, this was really one of the first books that did, that changed things for me. It's a novel, it's a super easy read. He wrote this in the mid eighties. Uh, Kermit opened a wine shop in Berkeley, California in 1972. For those listening who aren't totally familiar, and he was really the first importer in America to focus on small family producers. And that's still what we do today. Uh, we've been doing it for almost 50 years. And so we've amassed a collection of over 200 different small family farms that we represent in America. Uh, about 80% of it's French and 20% Italian. We only work with France and Italy, not because there aren't good wines elsewhere, just because you have to focus. And there's, there's so much in France, there's so much in Italy. Uh, we can't, we already can't get all of the wines we want to bring in. But Kermit's super rigorous as well. I think one of the things that attracted me to Kermit's book is um, that there's just not a bad wine in it. Kermit will taste a hundred different wines before he finds one he actually wants to bring into the country. And the stuff we're going to show you that you guys are tasting today is all from Piedmont. Uh, like Tim mentioned, it's also uh, probably where we do most of our work in Italy. And it's a place that's kind of been close to Kermit's heart for a long time. We work with four different producers in Barolo, one of which, which we'll be tasting is Lange Nebbiolo. And then just, uh, I think the, the focus of the other wines for me, I, you guys can uh, agree or disagree, but it's, it's all about like super awesome value and just kind of like everyday crushers. The first wine, uh, the Arnais uh, from Marco Tintero. This, uh, this is our number one uh, selling producer from Italy, uh, hands down. This is a guy named Marco Tintero. His father, Elvio, the label is still called Elvio Tintero, started an organic farm after World War II. And they're based in the town of Mongo, which is spelled like mango, but it's, it's on the Moscato d'Asti Strada, the famous street of uh, towns that all make Moscato d'Asti. Of course, a sparkling, slightly sweet wine from Italy. They make that as well. Uh, this is the local dry white. So if there are people watching and listening who are afraid of Moscato, don't worry, uh, this won't hurt you. This is dry white wine called Arnais. The grape is Arnais. It's a local Piedmontese white. Probably the most, uh, you know, there's most wine made in Piedmont is red. Uh, of that, which is white, Arnais is the most popular and the most widely planted. It's a grape that uh, when it's cooler, lesser ripe vintages, you get sort of green almonds, and white flowers and kind of almost a Sauvignon Blanc kind of thing happening, not as green perhaps. In warmer vintages with better fruit and ripeness, you get almost this peachy quality, this apricot stone fruit kind of thing. Um, we have Marco put everything in screw caps for us, so it's ready to just 
pop, you know, pop and play kind of thing. Um, this yeah. filling, it just says on the label Longue Arnais. Uh, Longue is the larger growing area uh, within that the Moscato d'Asti Strada is a part of. 50% uh, of the fruit in here is Arnais from Roero, which is the more famous place Arnais is from. Uh, it's also a warmer place and Arnais grown in Roero has even more of that rich sort of peachy kind of flavors. If you've had Bruno Giacosa, other examples of Arnais, you get more of that sort of rounder, more tropical fruit. Uh, Longue Arnais is a little bit more dialed back. It's a little bit more saline, a little salty, kind of fresh, more you know, for the table, less about fruit. Uh, and this bottling, even though it's labeled as Longue, this isn't too confusing, it's 50% Longue fruit and 50% Roero fruit. But because Longue is the larger appellation, they can declassify and just call it all Longue. That's so great. I'm so glad that you mentioned the Roero and Longhe difference because I, you know, Arnais is a grape that gets worked with in so many different contexts. And I've heard so many parallels for it. Um, you know, I hear some people kind of pushing it, you know, you're always trying to compare a lesser known grape um, to something that's a little bit more familiar, right? That's kind of our job, the parallels. Um, and I hear Chardonnay, I hear Sauvignon Blanc, I hear Gruner, I hear Albarino. And I don't think that any of those are wrong, but I, that's so awesome that you're able to put a little bit of geographical context into that to help better find styles um, that are more applicable to those different grapes. Because it, I think it often gets mentioned so broadly. How is Arnais drink in Piedmont? Is it, is it a daily drinker? Is it a summer thing? Is it table wine? Yeah, I think that the thing I've learned the most over this last decade working for Kermit, I've had the opportunity to travel to Europe uh, two, three, four times a year, every year, visit our growers, go to each different region, taste the foods of the area with the wines of the area. Uh, before I worked for Kermit, and when I was a sommelier for a decade, I uh, had traveled to Europe, but not extensively. And I, when I traveled, I was going to places like Florence and Venice and Rome, and, and I was drinking wine, but I wasn't really like seeing the source of where it came from. And the thing I guess that's really struck me and has become a part of my life now is that this idea of what grows together goes together. And Piedmont especially, like it's, it's still a pretty rural, rustic place. Uh, when you go to most restaurants in Piedmont, they don't have foods from all over the world. And they have a wine list that is exclusively Piedmontese wines. They don't have uh, Chianti. They don't have anything from Tuscany. They don't have anything from Venice. Their list, it could be two pages, it could be six pages, but generally it's only gonna be wines from the area, which I think from growing up in America, it's super you know, unusual for us because we have this you know, benefit of having wines from all over and it's kind of a part of our culture to sort of mix melting pot, bring in a bunch of stuff. But over there, they've got such a hyper local thing, um, especially Italy, because after World War II, as Europe was super poor and trying to rebuild, uh, you saw France become more, move, people moved towards the cities and they were getting better jobs and getting money. And so there was this more, a slight homogenization of the culture and of the cuisine and, and even of the wine styles. Whereas in Italy, even after the war, uh, it remained super poor and people stayed hyper-regional. Uh, Italy, as we know it, has only been a country for a pretty short amount of time. Uh, before that, people have this regional uh, association. It's like small town pride. Uh, I grew up in Kansas. And if you're going to high school in Kansas, you're voting for the, the you're rooting for the team. Uh, the, you know, Sterling Black Bears was our high school team. If you're not voting for them, like everybody hates you. So it's that same sort of small town pride that you get in Italy. When you're in Piedmont in the summer, uh, it's hot outside. You want to drink chilled white wine, at least to start before the sun goes down and you move into to Nebbiolo. Uh, on just about every single restaurant you go to, they will have carne cruda, which is kind of like tartare. It's a ground up raw veal meat, usually very simply dressed with some olive oil, salt, pepper, um, not much else than that. And, and you'll see vitello tonnato, which is uh, yeah. thinly sliced uh, veal, rare veal, uh, topped with a tuna mayonnaise and some, a few capers. Um, and like, it's like those two dishes and maybe a couple other things as the primi piatti on every restaurant menu in the entire region. Uh, and 
after you're there for a week, you're like, all right, I mean, this is awesome, but how about something different? But <laughs> the people are seriously <laughs> proud of their local dishes. And when you have Arnais in the summertime with those, with those dishes, those are pretty subtle, delicate dishes. A wine like Arnais that's not super hit you over the head, it's, it's a perfect, perfect match. I always say that Moscato is like the perfect breakfast wine because it's like a mimosa without the juice. So I feel like on a, on a perfect day in Piedmont, I'd, I'd wake up, have a little Moscato with my breakfast, have some Arnais with lunch, and then just drink reds the rest of the day. It's so true. And Marco Tintero, his daughter, uh, Margarita, I believe she's like five or six. She may be seven years old now, but she loves Moscato. And being a small girl, he's not obviously giving her lots of alcohol. His Moscato has, I think, five or six percent of alcohol in it, so it's a pretty low ABV. And he'll give her a little one ounce juice glass of it, and she's just like, "Papa, more, more!" And he's like, "No, no, we're not like drinking a full glass. You just get to taste it until you're old enough." Yeah, but she might take over the estate. She has to know. Pour, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's and great. Pouring Moscato over fresh strawberries or fresh peaches and having it as like a, a, an element of the food dish, whether it's for breakfast or for lunch or whatever. We've got a regular who makes uh, wineritas and he muddles a lime and pours Moscato over it and he, he swears by it. So yeah, I know we're getting a little off topic. Cody, what do you think about Arnais? Uh, Arnais is great. I haven't had um, too much exposure with it. I mean, I've been like for the eight years in restaurants, I think I've only really seen it in the past two years. And even then it's only been pretty limited. Um, I think most of the styles tend to be like, tend to be on that richer side, like you're mentioning that comes from the, from Raro, where they're a little more just like voluptuous, um, a little more on the peachy side. Um, this wine I really love. Um, it's probably the Arnis I like the most. Um, I think that like the, the little minerality that you get on the bottom is really clean. Um, and then like it is a bit fruity, but it's still very light and fresh. Like everything just seems so clean and fresh about this wine. Yeah, totally. I'd like to go in a little bit about how the wine's made. So, um, you know, one of the beautiful things about the Kermit Lynch website, which I'm going to keep bringing up throughout this, is how much detail and like the different layers of detail. You can learn the backstory of the family, what grapes are grown, where and what soils and how old they are, and then get into specific vinification techniques, which I think is just so important for us as wine professionals. But I also love relaying that information um, to our guests because we get a lot of nerds like we do and we love them and we're happy to continue the nerdery but uh you know these are younger vines a little bit of time in tank it sounds like on the lees yeah it's a pretty unusual process that marco has he has a lot of refrigerated stainless steel tanks which of course is a newer style when his father right. started the winery in the 40s they had cement tanks uh, now they've moved everything to temperature controlled stainless and they're pressurized. So he will keep wine in chilled, pressurized tanks, and he bottles to order. Uh, it's more impactful with Moscato. If, uh, you know, they, Moscato's harvested early and they are bottling the next release of the year. I wanna say they usually release it in late November, early December. So if, you send, if we send them an order for Moscato in, in August or July, if you've got stock that's been bottled a year ago, it's obviously not gonna be as fresh and as, as high quality as something that's fresh off the press. Marco, because he keeps it all in pressurized stainless steel tanks and bottles to order year round as we're ordering product from him, it's as fresh as can be and, and his crew cap again helps with that too. Uh, he does that for all the white wines. Obviously uh, he's degassed the Arnais to a certain extent. There's a, when you first crack it, you may have noticed this Tim, there's a little bit of uh, CO2 little, gas, yeah. just, just like almost not quite to vino verde level, but there's a little right. bit of gas there. And that, that helps him use less levels of uh, sulfur dioxide. Oh, cool. If you use more CO2, you, got, you can use less SO2. Uh, so, you know, it's a loppy air and Ron does, and that's, that's what Marco's doing just to keep the wine super fresh by keeping some trapped uh, gas in it. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it shows, you know, I'm going to be totally honest with you. This bottle was opened a couple days ago and I can't tell the difference. Yeah. It's super fresh. And it's so cool to see producers in regions that take so much time and energy into treating their wines differently because of how they benefit. You know, you talk about Barolo, Barbaresco, like they're going to lay those, downs, uh, those wines down for a while, keep them in wood, make sure they're ready before they release. But this is the total opposite. They're going to keep it and, and, and maintain the freshness. So that's, that's I, to me, that's such a sign of craftsmanship. 
the way they can, I know this word is uh, very popular nowadays, but pivot, um, the way they can, you know, use their, uh, their grapes and their wines to make the best product, I think is so fascinating. Yeah. And, and just as a quick aside, like I, I, people shouldn't be afraid that if, if you have a bottle of Arnace and you have got it in your cellar for a year or two, it's not, it's not a problem. It's not like, you know, an old bottle of, of cheap beer that's going to go bad or anything like that. Just, yeah. Right. I mean, yeah, it's got acid, it's got texture. Um, and you mentioned stainless steel. Do you want to touch just briefly on that about, you know, the temperature controlled stainless steel and how that, how that preserves that freshness? I mean, it's inert, so you don't yeah. have any flavor from it, of course. Oh, so. cool. Just like using, uh, historically, it would be glass line tanks or cement tanks. Uh, those are also inert, but a lot of producers believe that there's a slight difference between cement, uh, which has some sort of porosity to it, versus stainless steel, which has no porosity to it. So nothing escapes or goes in, um, which is, again, like why they degas it partially. Otherwise, it would be, be like fully fully sparkling. That's a awesome. Slight, a slight degassing all the way. Cool, cool. Well, that's that's awesome. I say we jump right into the Canteen Valpon. You want to give us a little backstory on that, the Canteen Valpon? Yeah. Let me, you guys have the Fresa or you have the Ruque? We are doing the Ruque today, but we have worked with the Fresa very successfully. I'm sorry, my bottle's a little messy. Usually uh, the label's much cleaner. You can see we've got some mileage on this one. It's a part of the charm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Cool. Yeah. A Cantina Valpane is a guy named Pietro Arditi, who is up in the Monferrato Hills, north of Asti. So this is kind of away from the more fancy district of Barolo and Barbaresco. This is um, going up, if you're driving up towards Switzerland, going up north. Uh, this is kind of out in more gentle rolling hills. Uh, when I first went to Piedmont for the first time, I was pretty struck by how steep the vineyards are. I, in my head, I thought, oh, it's gonna be kind of like Burgundy with like gentle rolling slopes. Piedmont is much different than that. This slopes are um, almost like Cote de Bruy and Beaujolais or towards some things in the Northern Rhone where they're really steep exposure. And whether you have a vineyard that's North facing or South facing or East facing, you get radically different expressions from the grape variety. Because of the sun, uh, in the Monferrato Hills, it's a little bit more gentle rolling. It kind of looks a little bit like most of Beaujolais or like Burgundy in that regard. Um, and Pietro Arditi has this old horse farm that is doing pretty rustic style, old style wines. They're farming everything organically. Uh, they make mostly Barbera. Barbera is the number one planted grape in Piedmont. Uh, but in addition to that, they have a collection of these old heirloom native grapes, a lot of which are almost extinct being Grignolino, Ruque, uh, and Fresa. Uh, so the Ruque that you have is quite exceptional in terms of it's just like um, very floral. Thing. You, you, it, it's a relative to Nebbiolo. Um, Levy yeah. explained a lot of the native grapes in Piedmont like Nebbiolo is a hand and like you get all parts of them, but then Grignolino and Dolcetto and Ruque and Barbera uh, all of the fingers represent different things that all came from this mother plant that has characteristics of all of them. And I think that makes sense when you taste uh, a Grignolino or you taste a Fresa, you, you do pick yeah. up things that are kind of Nebbiolo-like, but it doesn't have all parts of the wheel. Uh, right. Ruque is probably the most rare of any of those grapes mentioned of the old heirloom things. There's only a few people left who have Ruque left. Uh, he's not allowed to grow it in the Monferrato Hills and call it Ruque which is why the label, if you want to show the label again, says yeah. Rosa Ruske. Uh, it's actually a play on words based on a neighbor's, uh, the name of a neighbor of his. And so uh, he's, a lot of his wines have different like jokey kind of tongue in cheek names about them. But the reality is this is Ruke, super old school, uh, very floral, great variety. If you talk about uh, Nebbiolo having this rose petal and tar sort of thing, to me, Ruke has more of the rose petal than the tar. It's got really like violets and, and yeah, hundred percent. And I, you know, it's I'm so glad you brought up all those grapes because Cody and I spent a little bit of time at the bar yesterday, and I brought this home just to prove people that we do our homework. Um, you know, we were trying to find. We're like, wait, is it is it Ruske? Is it Ruke? Is it Mosca Tolino? And it turns out it's the answer is yes. Um, you know, it's really hard to uh, get into Piedmont um, at 
you know, it's easy to think about Piedmont and just a couple grapes, but when you, it's not hard to find so much more exciting, so many more exciting things. And um, I was blown away by some of the fresos we've had. The Grignolino that we worked with in the past was outstanding. And I didn't realize that they were all part of the Nebbiolo family. And I'm totally going to go look at these through different eyes now. So now I want to line up next virtual tasting. We're getting all five and then Nebbiolos. And that's going to, we're going to do it. It'll be awesome. Well, it's super fun when you taste at Cantina Valpane because I, they're one of the few producers who has all of those. And you can taste the Grignolino, Fresa, Ruque, and Barbera. Uh, they don't make Dolcetto or Nebbiolo because they're, in the Monferrato Hills, but it's, it's fun to, to sort of compare the differences. They served us once a little uh, crostini, a little toasted uh, baguette that was toasted with olive oil, and they put chocolate ganache on top, and then a thinly sliced piece of lardo, uh, like you would slice prosciutto, but just the lardo, like lardo di colonnata, if you've had that. And to have this like salty pig fat and rich chocolate ganache with, with a crostini, we're thinking like, what, what, this is the weirdest thing ever. It went perfectly, and they served it with the Grignolino and Fresa and, and the Ruque. Really? That's, it's like a salty chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> yeah, and all of those grapes that we mentioned have, the reason they're not more popular is because they're hard to work with. Um, and historically, a lot of people have made sweet versions of them because Ruque and Fresa in particular have uh, a lot of seed to skin ratio. And because of a lot of seeds, if you're not careful, you can make a wine that's really tannic and really bitter. Uh, a little bit of that bitterness is nice. There was a really awesome article recently by Eric Asimov in the New York Times about bitterness in wine. And I think right. going back to the Arnais, you have this slight bitter almond thing. Uh, you may not be used to drinking that if you're used to more fruity wines, but once you are used to having it at the table with certain food combinations, it really makes everything pop. And I think you find that with this Ruque. It has this slight bitter thing without being super tannic, without being, it's not, of course, not a sweet wine like some are, but um, yeah, very, very interesting sort of play off at the table. Yeah, absolutely. And I noticed that, uh, you know, it's pretty long ferment right around, I think we wrote down 23 days. Is that how they're getting those phenolics out of the skins and the seeds to create a little bit of that bitterness without pulling too much uh, t tannin, as you mentioned? He doesn't extract, he doesn't press super hard. Okay. Uh, and he, like this, the, the setup at Valpane is super old school and rustic. It's a dirt yeah. cellar just below. Like you, you drive into their place and it's this sort of U-shaped old horse barn. It's all like old horse barns covered in hay. Uh, you drive down and his winery, his, his cellar is just, just below there. It's a below ground cellar carved into the dirt. He's got some old tanks in there that are enamel cast iron tanks. Uh, and then he's got a bunch of old barriques that are, you know, really, really neutral because they're so old. So there's no taste of wood in his wines. Generally, he's saving the, the wood barrels for his Barbera. Uh, he does some late release uh, Barberas that have been held back for five or, or more years. So uh, a different program there. But as far as, as far as the approach there, I think it's... Um, nothing, nothing, nothing's temperature controlled. So he's not uh, heating it up or chilling it down to make things go faster. So yeah. things, things move a little slowly because it's just a naturally non-temperature controlled cellar. Okay, cool. Yeah, you know, I've noticed that a lot of rusticity in the wines, um, you know, sometimes maybe a little bit of Britannomyces. I really feel like it's, it's a very feral, very um, not natural in the sense of like natural wine, um, but it just, it feels, there's so many wines that, you know, don't feel like you're taken to a place these wines feel like you're in the hills, you're in a very rustic area, and it's really a very sensual uh, kind of experience, I think. That's a really, really good thing you brought up because uh, this is like one of the wines in our book that I would never give to uh, like a US winemaker friend of mine because if when you learn about winemaking in school and by the book and they really teach you a different method, which is to look for flaws. Right rather than to look for the place first. And, and not that that's wrong, it's just different. And uh, right. a lot of times people are tasting wine and they're, they're looking to pick out flaws. And once you get used to doing that, you get the slightest whiff. People have a different threshold for Brett or for VA, um, but this is definitely one of those properties that they can be on the fence sometimes, depending on the year, especially in a warmer year, you can have more Britannomyces. So uh, if you know you're someone who doesn't like Brett, this isn't the wine I would recommend for you. 
Uh, but we think it's just just the right amount to still be charming and, and rustic. And yeah. Cody, I love your input on this because I feel like we've talked about Britannomyces in a couple of these wines. And we, every time we discuss it, we're like, you know, it's there, but it's integrated. It's not punching you in the face. Like, it's, it's enjoyable. It's just part of the wine. Yeah, I find a lot of, of these wines that can get a little bready. Sometimes it's very easy to, without even having that over the top and just be like covering over everything else in the wine. Um, and I really do like all of Alpani's products. I think they all do a fantastic job of just like really making a, a smooth wine, just letting it uh, evolve naturally, which leads to a beautiful result. Um, I also wanted to ask, just talking about how all the smaller grapes for Piedmont refer to as like the fingers of the hand of Nebbiolo. Um, I still, I think especially with Valpani's productions, um, the wines have a good amount of acid. How long do you think these could age for? Um, certainly the Barberos that he makes mm -hmm. have a lot of aging potential uh, and he'll hold them back and release, uh, you know, reserve a level Barberos. Okay. I, I think right now he's still selling some 07. Um, so, you know, o over 10 years when he's releasing them and, then, and how long they can go from that is just a matter of your, the vintage, of course, and then your personal preference. But there is a, there's a verb in Italian for Barbera. Uh, they say, as it begins to age, it begins to taste like Nebbiolo. And I, I was at a tasting once with Roberto Conterno and we had his Barbera with over 10 years in the bottle and it tasted like a Barolo. Um, yeah, the big wines, the Conterno Barberas are huge. Yeah, his are especially large, but I think with uh, these wines too, when you taste older Barbera from Valpane, uh, you can think that you're, you know, in, in Barolo area almost. That's so cool. That's so awesome. Wow. What are the chances of us getting some of those 07 current releases in Texas? We have we have some library stuff available. I'll, uh, okay. All right. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. That sounds like a lot of fun. Cool. Well, I say we jump right into the next. We're going to talk Dolcetto. Nice. Cool. Il Palazzotto. This is Dolcetto di Diano d'Alba. So I'm sure most people who've had Dolcetto, you've seen uh, maybe Doliani, other communes. I don't see a lot of Diano d'Alba in the U.S. market. It is one of the two most highly prized places in Piedmont for Dolcetto. Uh, and this is a grower who only makes Dolcetto as far as wine. His main business is um, hazelnuts. He's got a hazelnut farm in Diano d'Alba. It's also a terroir that's good for hazelnuts. And he's got a, just a few hectares of grapevines, but it's exclusively Dolcetto just because that's what this place is known for. Diano d'Alba is similar to Doliani in that way. Uh, we, he's, we met him through the Fantino brothers, one of our Barolo producers, who made the wines at Bartolo Mascarello for 20 years, and Alessandro Fantino is considered one of the, the legends of Piedmont for great Barolo. And this, this is his buddy who's just down the road. Uh, and we were asking them, like, okay, what's the difference between your terroir at Diano d'Alba, where you're making this lovely but you know, affordable, you know, whatever it is, $14 wholesale dolcetta versus this terroir here in Monforte d'Alba where you're making $50 Barolo. And the Fantino brothers and him both said, there's no difference. This is, it's, this, it's really like politics. So these are steep hillsides. Uh, they are going for dolcetto in the old style, which is dolcetto with acid. Uh, right. Dolcetto, when I first started being a wine buyer in restaurants and retail. This is over 20 years ago. Uh, there was this sort of thing happening in the 90s about producers making wine for the American market. And you saw it in Spain, you saw it in Italy and France. And there were a lot of dolcetto producers like using a flashy colorful looking label and putting the wine in stainless steel, heating up the tanks, doing a fast ferment. So you have this dark purple wine uh, picking later and having very low acid. So the wines are kind of higher in alcohol, more extracted, really purple. I think the history of Dolcetto, at least uh, for these guys and for us, like that's not true to what this used to be about. Dolcetto is like what everybody drinks locally. Most yeah, people you can see the pigment here, but that is not this wine. This is not, I mean, it looks dark on the screen due to technology, but I mean, 
I can almost read through this. Yeah. Um, it's beautiful color, tons of concentration. And, and super high acid. So oh, yeah. absolutely. For people, you know, for people who aren't used to Dolce, or if people are used to the other style of Dolcetto and they just want this kind of basic sweet fruit, this is not that. This is a food one. This is, um, yeah. I have pizza when I have, you know, red sauce loves acid. So uh, Dolcetto in this old style at the table is way more interesting. I like to serve it slightly chilled, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, totally. No, I think this is such a versatile food wine. And, you know, people, I, I find that people can often take Italian wine out of context when it, when it doesn't have some of those pairings to go with it because they're so, they're so intense, they're so flavorful. They have so much structure and, you know, a few sips of this and, and your, your mouth is watering and like, I'm thinking about pizza very intensely right now. Like I could just eat a whole pie with this. So I think that's, that's such an interesting side of how, you know, we can talk Barolo and Barbaresco and how, you know, fancy and sophisticated, but we can also find wine out of Piedmont that was just perfect for pizza and more casual cuisine. Yeah, totally. So at this point, I think we got to move on to this long hay, which, you know, in my opinion, long hay is having a bit of a day these days. And maybe that's just because we're in Houston, Texas, where it's hot as hell, nine months a year. Um, can you go before we get into the producer and, you know, Nebbiolo and the wine and the place and the people, um, just long hay versus Barolo and Barbaresco, just so we can set the table a little bit. Yeah, the long hay is... Uh the major growing region in Piedmont that encompasses Barolo and Barbaresco. So you can make Barolo mm -hmm. and declassify it and call it a Longue Nebbiolo or same, same for uh, Barbaresco. Uh, and in fact, that's what this wine is. So this is from Barolo. Mm -hmm. uh, it's from a vineyard, it's from a crew, single vineyard in Barolo in the town of Saralunga. This is Guido Poro is the producer if we want to show the label. Sure. Um, Longue is the larger geographical area that, that encompasses Barolo. Guido could, could legally call this Barolo, but he chooses not to. It says on the label Camilu, which was the old owner's name of this parcel. It's right across from the uh, Lazarito crew where Guido Poro has most of his vineyards. Uh, it's surrounded on three sides by uh, Angelo Gaia vineyards. This is again, all Barolo vineyards. Angelo Gaia makes this wine as Barolo. It sells for two to three hundred dollars a bottle. Guido doesn't. He's like one of the old guard, like r humble country farmers of the of the Saralunga town. Really respected by other growers, but totally off the radar. His entire winery is like four thousand cases a year. So he's not a big name. He doesn't get the press and the points. He, we, we don't submit samples to the Wine Spectator. We just quietly sell the wines to people who know about him. But this vineyard is surrounded by Angelo Gaia Barolo on three sides. Guido doesn't think it's good enough to call Barolo. So he purposefully declassifies it, releases it young. Um, it's released a year earlier than he would release his Baroli. But other than that, it's made in the exact same way. Large uh, Slavonian Boti. He doesn't have any Barica. He's super old school in that approach as well. He doesn't believe in small casks. He thinks that Nebbiolo the history of the area is to have uh, larger casks that have less oxygen uh, to, to juice ratio, so longer aging. And then this is just released a little bit younger, and it's it's also more ready to drink younger than his Barolo. Um, not that his Barolo is super tannic or needs a ton of time, but uh, if you like Barolo and you want to have that experience, kind of an everyday Barolo, this is this is why this wine's become so successful for us. We we've taken to allocating this and it sells out every year but uh oh wow yeah, i think I, for the for the price of what that is i think it's a totally crazy value oh 100 percent. and and i love how you touched on the little bit of youth slightly fresher maybe and like you know just going back to like houston how it how it's so suitable for us in the summer like this is the nebbiola that i want to drink right now um i don't need to be sitting around a fire i don't need roast beast i can just sit around and drink this and it's so outstanding um, so that's cool. Can you, can you touch a little bit about the, you know, the, the traditional versus the modern approach in making Nebbiolo? Cause I know that's, that's seen a lot of different waves. Yeah, it, it's, uh, I mean, Piedmont was a 
a poor region, of course, after you know, Phylloxera hit Europe, and then after that you had the World Wars, and so a lot of these places were decimated. Uh, Piedmont was less decimated than other places, so if you compare uh, the poverty in Piedmont to Abruzzo, it's another story, but I still think um, there wasn't a worldwide market for the wines. Um, Barolo, of course, and then Barbaresco marketed themselves as kind of the the grand van of Italy, and they had they had the most success marketing themselves until Brunello came along much later. But um, yeah, I guess because of that, um, Piedmont's still kind of off the radar. Even even in like the last thirty years, people weren't collecting it in America. They weren't putting it aside like a lot of them are today. I still think it's tremendous value. You can get really good producers. The the Barolos from Guido Poro sell, I think, retail, Cody, correct me, but like $55, $60 a bottle. Um, that, that should be correct, yeah. Something, yeah, that right. something in that range. So $100 a bottle around the $60 mark for, you know, A-list, really good grower, Barolo. That's, that's compare that to Burgundy. To, to, right. get, to get just a village Gevre Chambertin, not even Premier Cru or Grand Cru, the village level, it's over $100 today. So I think young people collecting, trying to put away wines and, and build a cellar, uh, you have a lot more room to, to move in, in Piedmont. Right, and a lot more flexibility on the, the amount of time. You, you don't have the, the deadline isn't as near. You know, obviously great Burgundy can age forever, but you know, it's so vintage dependent, you know, it's such a wine of place, not a wine of process. I, I think it's almost a little safer to go with, um, you know, a lot of wines from uh, Piedmont. I think they have longevity just due to their winemaking and their structure. They've got those uh, physiological elements that help them go the distance, which create a lot of value. Yeah, I think you, you asked about uh, winemaking styles and how that whole shift changed, uh, mm -hmm. which I think I got off, off topic on, but- No worries, there's yeah. no topic, <laughs> whatever sounds good, man. Um, the idea that, that Piedmont was a poor place. They had a hard time marketing their wines. Uh, these were pretty poor dirt farmers, basically. And here comes this idea of modernization. Uh, people had traveled around the world and they've seen, oh, this is what people in Bordeaux are doing. Here's what people in Napa are doing. I can use small barricas, small burgundy size or Bordeaux size barrels, 225, 228 liter barrels versus the large old Slovenian Boti. And if I do that, uh, I can catch the attention of the press. And so you had a, a lot of people, and even there's still people today still doing that uh, in Piedmont. There's less, there was really a thing that like rose to prominence in the 90s. Uh, it kind of topped out and a lot of those things lost their market. And now you have this, I think a younger crowd, people your age who are more excited about the old style of wine and this kind of access to this beautiful culture that still exists there and that we of course don't have in America a wine culture that old. Um, so I think that the, the style, people went crazy modernist in the 90s. Um, the ones who were super modernist have dialed it back. The ones who were super rustic and old school have also cleaned up their act a little bit. Mm. Maria Teresa uh, Mascarello also like wrote an article about this, how styles that were once so divergent and there was like old school and modern and you know this big chasm in between. I think it's both sides have narrowed. There are still producers who are more classic and producers who are more modern, but we're in a world now where uh, education is more widely accessible, um, cleaner winemaking is, is more common, and you have people a little bit more close to center, I guess. It's the opposite of uh, US politics. Right, I was, just, I was just thinking that. I was like, one of us has to touch on that. So, um, but no, I think that's really interesting because you know, we read wine books, right, as, as industry professionals and as people that just are really passionate about wine. And, and books are usually written in, the, in you know, looking backwards. Um, so we're, we're observing kind of what has happened. And there's so much fashion in wine, whether it's extraction, hang times, um, oak usage, but it's kind of a pendulum, right? And I think that's really, that's really important that you mentioned that and really informative for me and everyone that you know, things have kind of gone back to the center because I think when you read a lot of books or watch some, you know, documentary style things, you hear about this big divisive movement between 
modern and traditional and generations not speaking to each other. And, it, and, it, and it's very easy to play it up as this dramatic thing. But I, but I love you saying that like it's, it's not as much as it used to be. Um, because I noticed that in the wine. And when I, when I look into different wines, I don't, I don't see that faction. But when you read about it in books and watch it in movies, you hear about it a lot. So I guess it's good to see that at least some culture in the world can show some moderate tendencies because we can't. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a thing that Kermit talks about that in his book about experiencing this old France that he discovered in the 60s and 70s. And then throughout the 80s and 90s, he saw a lot of it kind of go away or be changed to be homogenized, Americanized. Um, France today is the number one growing market in the world for McDonald's. So it's not like this idea of Americanization and modernization is over. It's, it's still a threat. Uh, Jonathan Nosser touched on it in Montefino. But I, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful for the young, young generation. Uh, and I apologize for the drilling. I'm sure you can do that now. They're drilling on the side of the jackhammer. This is New York, baby. Yeah. Man, I lived uh, 61st and 1st for a few months. And it, you know the, the scene in the Blues Brothers when he's like, how often does the train go by? It's so often you don't even notice it. It's the same with ambulances and jackhammers and drills. Gotta love the city, right? Yeah. Well, Lyle, it looks like we lost Cody. The Camerata's internet um, reared its ugly head like it usually does for anyone who's tried to get any work done at our bar. You know that our internet is not strong. But um, Lyle, I can't thank you enough for taking the time to speak with us and educate us, um, you know, and being part of such a wonderful organization that is really a, a trailblazer for wine culture in the United States and providing so much information to us as uh, consumers and professionals. Like, it's just so important and it means so much to us that you took the time to, uh, you know, teach us a little bit about these wines today. Uh, it was really my pleasure, man. Thanks so much for supporting us and introducing these wines to your clients. Uh, it's a cool little four pack you put together. I hope everybody likes the wines and yeah. feel free to reach out if there are questions or if people want to uh, yeah, talk about them. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I, I really hope we can get you back. I know we got the, we got the pleasure of you know, doing a little tasting with you in I think February before the world ended. So Hopefully when things get back to normal, we'll be able to have you at the bar again. It might not be for the game of Rones, but we can p think of some other corny thing to do. So I'll, I'll be back there before the end of the year for sure. So hopefully Excellent. We'll later. Excellent. Can't wait, man. Well, again, thank you so much for the time. And for all those uh, joining at home, you know, be sure to check us out on Instagram, go to the website. All these wines are available for purchase in store and for delivery to your home. So Hopefully we create some good content for you and we look forward to seeing you at the bar.